Yeah, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, maybe I heard from a few of you, uh, it's also my first in-person conference since two years, um, so I'm excited to meet people again, uh, to shake hands, to be at coffee breaks, to exchange. Uh, the last time I was traveling, it was to Saudi Arabia, 2020, just before the lockdown. And I have to say, Munich is a bit more fun than Coast. <laughs> so happy to be here. Um, yeah, so actually, I'm, I'm quite new to the Fraunhofer FEP. I just started last June 2021. Um, I was in Amsterdam before that, and so I'm also getting to know the Institute. What I want to do today is I want to present a bit of an overview of the activities that we have, the technologies and the projects that go towards printed electronics. Yeah, so maybe I will start with a, just a very short introduction and explanation of what is the Fraunhofer Society. I mean, I met, I met a lot of my Fraunhofer colleagues here yesterday, and, and probably everybody here is familiar with the Fraunhofer Society. Um, but I often get the same questions about it. And so the point is, the Fraunhofer Society is the leading, and when I say the leading, I mean the biggest, uh, organization dedicated to applied research. So the mission of the Fraunhofer Society is really to close the gap between fundamental or lab scale research and industrial needs for new solutions, right? So it should be this sort of innovation bridge between the lab and the product. So in Germany, we have 75 institutes, I believe now, it might be 76 now, combined with research centers, so not full research institutes, but also research um, units that are operating. There's also a number of Fraunhofer institutes outside of Germany that are associated with German partners. And it all flies under the Fraunhofer flag, but each research institute is a market unit for itself. So it has its individual budget, and it has individual competencies. So the Fraunhofer FEP, it's located in Dresden. Um, and so actually Dresden is a bit of a capital city for Fraunhofer, simply because there's a lot of Fraunhofer institutes there. And so we're located at the Fraunhofer campus in Dresden, and actually the FEP has the most beautiful buildings there. I'm a little bit biased, but we're located in the old... Is there a laser? Can you see the laser? Okay, anyways, so we're located in the um, former Academy of Sciences building of the GDR. And so that means it's very hot in the summer and very cold in the winter, but it looks fantastic. And our neighbors are the IWS, the IKTS, and the IFAM, um, who are also all present here. And so we have about 200 people working at the Fraunhofer FEP. And we have an annual budget approaching 30 million. And typical to Fraunhofer, about 30 to 40 percent of that budget is dedicated to direct contracts or works or projects with industry. So at the FEP, we're specialized in a few things. Of course, every Fraunhofer Institute has very specific competences. So we have synergies between the institutes, but each institute stands for itself with its competences. And at the Fraunhofer FEP, we're focused, in a nutshell, on surface treatments, coatings, and film deposition. So what we do is we do the full chain from hardware development down to working on a product with a customer. And so specifically the competences that we have are on the development of hardware like electron beam technologies. So we really work on producing different types of cathodes depending on the applications. And these cathodes are used for applications where you might do a treatment directly on a substrate or on a sample, or we use it, for example, to produce plasma. So that's sort of the second core competence, is plasma-activated large area coating. So what we do is a lot of vacuum roll-to-roll -roll coating, but also precision coating, where we look at creating high-quality layers on smaller scales than roll-to-roll. -roll. So it's still much larger than what you would see in the laboratory, but smaller than sort of these roll-to-roll -roll flecks. We also look at developing hardware as well as process chains for vacuum-based roll-to-roll technologies. So we look at working together with machine builders, for example, and developing new solutions for roll-to-roll -roll processes. And this, of course, involves the development of technological key components, so hardware related to these machines. And what we also do is, of course, because we're looking at large-scale vacuum processing, we work on organic electronics. So this falls, of course, into the theme of 
precision printing or, or deposition or rule-to-rule -rule upscaling. Um, closely related but slightly different di direction, something a little bit smaller, we also look at micro displays. So looking at OLEDs integrated on silicon CMOS for micro displays for augmented reality or for, sensor, uh, for sensors. So the idea, this is sort of the process chain, is that we look at for example, testing of substrate materials and properties. So we might start out on any type of substrate, either rigid or flex. Um, work together with our partners to develop a coating technology. So depending on the materials that they're depositing, whether it's insulating, semiconducting, or metals, we look at what is the best coating technology. Looking at the process chain for the coating um, and developing any sort of machine parts or system parts that are required for that coating process and ultimately going towards a product, uh, pilot production with the partner. So we don't actually work on the applications, we don't actually make the end product ourselves, but we work on all of the technological steps and innovation questions going towards that. So specifically what we're looking at is we start at the substrate level, so this might be a rigid substrate like a glass sheet or a polymer sheet, metals, plates, silicon wafers for example if we're looking at micro displays, or we look at flex substrates like polymer webs, also thin metal foils, ultra thin glass, and membranes. And we look at tuning the surface properties depending on the application. So looking at, for example, chemical or thermal resistivity, so making the, the surface more uh, robust against the elements, making it scratch proof, controlling the conductivity of the surface, antibacterial treatments or biocompatibility, diffusion barriers, so again towards encapsulation, changing transmission properties, reflection or color of the surface, or looking at sterilization. And of course the goal is that this should be done on a scale where you have good homogeneity, uniformity and reproducibility of all the properties that are needed for the application. So we don't do exclusively plasma assisted deposition, but it's a big focus at the institute. And so what we're looking at, for example, is the development of plasma assisted processes for thin film deposition. And this means working really on the hardware to establish the process as well as the process parameters and um, the upscaling of the process. So for example, we look at high rate evaporation. So here we have a thermal boat where we have non-neutral, uh, sorry, neutral non-excited particles, and we can use a plasma activation, so here you can see it over the hollow cathode, so this is the electron beam technology I was discussing before, where we generate a plasma, and the interaction of these neutral thermally evaporating particles with this plasma changes the properties so that we get excited ionized particles. And by doing this, we can control the energy of these particles, and then control the film formation. And this is of course interesting if you want to look at substrates that are sensitive to temperature. So you can start to process on less, yeah, sort of more sensitive substrates using high energy uh, particles. Magnetron sputtering, so we really do the technology development of the magnetron itself. And the goal is to look at how we can turn sputtering into a high uh, rate and interesting for the industry process, so how can we actually turn sputtering, which is typically a little bit slow, a little bit expensive, into something that's interesting for industry. And we also look at, for example, uh, plasma-enhanced chemical vapor deposition, if we're looking at towards protection layers, scratch-proof layers, and encapsulants. Okay, so I'll show you a couple of highlights from the FEP. Uh, maybe the most obvious thing at the LOPEC is going big, so how do we scale up on flex and look towards roll-to-roll -to -roll solutions for things like printed electronics? So a lot of the focus that we're looking at for roll-to-roll, -roll, um, at least that are relevant for the LOPEC, are energy applications or lighting applications or packaging applications. And so we do this by looking at processes, always under a vacuum, or, well, we do have atmosphere processes, but we're mostly focused on vacuum processes. Um, and we develop the process parameters in laboratory equipment, for example, equipment where you have a couple of sources where you can really tune the process parameters to get the quality of the layer that you require for the application. And this looking at sort of smaller scale, lower TRL um, sort of questions. And we also have in combination pilot scale equipment where we can look more with industry partners at upscaling processes, um, getting, working on larger substrates and working on higher TRL levels. 
So this is an example of roll-to-roll -roll processing, for example, for organic electronics, where actually the continuation of the process chain with each step is really an important thing for the end product. So really being able to master each of these process steps. And so this begins maybe with a substrate inspection where you really look at the defects on the substrate where I'm starting. Is it clean? Am I ready to go? Then a structuring of the substrate, or if you're putting down electrodes, structuring of those electrodes. Again, inspecting the substrate to make sure that you haven't introduced any defects due to the structuring. Vacuum coating of your organic electronic layer, your transport layers, and then an encapsulation step at the end. And what's really important, of course, for sensitive materials and sensitive substrates is that you can do these process chains in a way that you don't disrupt or disturb or destroy the layer that you've just deposited. So to do this in a roll-to-roll -roll process where you don't touch the layer that you've just deposited. Okay, and we also look at encapsulation. Of course, this is an important question actually just for many technologies, many emerging technologies, also for the food industry. How do we encapsulate things on a larger scale, in a low cost way, in order to um, withstand the elements or the conditions that the product is exposed to? So, for example, we've worked in EU projects, this is an ongoing one, on encapsulation films for organic solar cells for outdoor use, where you can see the uh, the roll-to-roll -roll process here, and the water vapor transmission rates, which we can also measure at the Institute under standard conditions. Okay, what we also look a lot at is thin glass, so flexible glass, and how you can process it in roll-to-roll. -roll. Um, this is uh, actually quite an interesting topic, because if the glass breaks in the machine, it's not that much fun, as I, as I learned from the PhD students. So, of course, flexible glass, it, it bends till it breaks, and when it breaks, you have 100,000 pieces in your hand. So how do you, how do you take this thin glass and process it in, in a useful way? It's a relatively expensive substrate still, um, but it has a lot of promise, of course, in different applications. So how can we develop process change for thin glass that make it actually interesting for industry? So this is an example from the Laola project, um, where they're looking at large area OLED lighting on flexible thin film uh, glass substrates. Um, what's also interesting for the thin film glass activities is looking towards things like th thermochromic or electrochromic smart windows where you can change the transmission properties of the window depending on a stimulus that either comes from electrostimulus or a thermal stimulus from temperature. So what you essentially have is an autonomous shading um, application where your window has a functional layer with a high transmission and if the temperature or electro uh, electrical stimulus on the window um, changes, then you get a shading effect. So you still have transparency, and here you can see in yellow one of our beautiful neighbor houses from the Fountain for FEP, where you can see that half of the window has uh, been switched from highly transparent to blocking out higher wavelengths. So here you can see a roll-to-roll -roll sputtered um, tungsten oxide, nickel oxide electrochromic layer um, that we're working on. Um, the challenge here is really getting the homogeneity on the large scale over the full substrate, so that means in the length as well as the width, without having any changes in the phase of the material that are unexpected due to inhomogeneous process parameters. Okay, and one of the exciting things is of course to then integrate all of these different uh, expertise or advances into autonomous wearable applications. For example, organic solar cells, thermoelectric devices, um, small roll-to-roll, -roll, lightweight batteries that are flexible, bendable printable circuits, and to integrate this all into wearable electronics, for example, for textile integration. And so this is another um, project that we're in where we're looking at controlling things like the thickness, the weight, um, the output power, of course you want to have very, very low output power if you're looking towards wearables. Cost should be reasonable that it's uh, actually interesting. And you should have some freedom in the shape and the design so that you have some uh, tunability. Okay, so we do big things, but we also do small things. Um, what we're also looking at, and flexible can mean a lot of different things. It can be mechanical, it can mean big. But what it can also mean is reducing the size and integrating emerging technologies into new applications. And so what we also look at at the Institute is integrating OLEDs into uh, micro displays and into set optoelectronic sensors. So the idea is that if you have an OLED which has a very, very high luminosity, 
Um, and you integrate into the CMOS, the silicon CMOS with a low power. You have a high output with low power, and this is interesting for wearables and for example, more specifically for applications like augmented reality, so Google Glasses, for example. And the challenge there is to actually get to um, luminosities from your OLED that are high enough that you can really see it in daylight. Um, so, where the advantages are is that for the OLED, of course, you have multispectral possibilities. You can really tune the output emission of an OLED with the full visible spectrum, and even towards the near infrared. And you can combine this very flexible emission with the low power consumption of the silicon CMOS backplate. So the expertise at the front of your uh, FEP is really to integrate this OLED front plane into this CMOS back plane. So the idea is that as we get emerging electronics, new materials that go away from traditional silicon, how do we integrate them into the existing silicon platform or pipeline? So the benefit, of course, of OLED is that you can get very high resolution. In principle, depending on the deposition uh, application that you're using, you can get relatively good pixel sizes. And so what we see is we get a dot pitch ranging between 2 to 50 micrometers, depending on how it's deposited and what the uh, requirements are for the application. And fast switching, so it's between microseconds and nanoseconds, which is, of course, very important if you want to have data transmission in real time. OK, so the MIT competences here are the integrated circuit design, so really integrating OLEDs into CMOS uh, technologies, the design of the OLED as far as the spectral parameters go, um, the post-processing on silicon, the silicon, so the actual concrete integration of the technology, the testing of the technology to see the reliability, the electronics design and system design, software, of course if you're doing some sort of sensing or augmented reality, you also need to couple your hardware to your software, and technical consulting. Yeah, and so the last highlight I want to present with you is sustainability. So this came up a few times. Of course, one of the advantages of looking at printable electronics or low-cost flexible electronics, organic electronics, is that we hope that we can actually make a more sustainable platform. And in the worst case, we make a lot more garbage. I mean, that would be a disaster, of course, right? So how do we, how do we actually turn these new innovations into something sustainable. And so what we're also starting to look at more is recyclable electronics. So either making electronics from recyclable materials or being able to recycle the materials that we're using for the electronic platform, as well as biodegradable ac applications, which can be very relevant if you start to go, of course, towards medical applications where maybe you have an implant or something that should disappear after a certain amount of time in the body. You don't want to open up the body again and take it out. Okay, so one of the projects we're working on is organic solar cells on recycled plastics. So this means recycled materials or plastics are taken out of the Gelbezak in, the, in Germany and turned into a, a substrate. Here we can then do the full roll to roll deposition process to create an organic PV. Um, the efficiencies are not yet anything to write home about, of course. One of the questions is how to control the effects on recycled uh, substrates. So, yeah, maybe to summarize, I hope I'm within time. I hope I was able to give you a little bit of an overview of sort of the broad activities that we're working on. Um, so on one hand, we're looking at roll-to-roll -roll vacuum processes for a range of different applications where we really work on everything from developing hardware, developing the process chain, um, almost to the application where we're looking at everything from energy harvesting, storage, packaging. Um, also using these competences to look at smaller applications like OLEDs on silicon for micro displays and sensors and finally looking towards more sustainable directions and actually there's um, two talks from the institute this afternoon one from Christian May and he's going to look at uh, RFID so biode um, biodegradable electronics on RFID um, towards sustainability and Michelle Hoffman who's speaking after him who's looking at biodegradable organic TFTs. So if you're interested you can get more details on these projects from them. And if you're interested in seeing some of the applications you can also visit our booth so it's E0308. Okay, thank you very much for your attention and of course I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Elizabeth, for this great talk. Um, I'm sure there is some questions. 
I at least have one remark up front. This smart girl, she, it's already here. So it's, uh, uh, Yuan uh, was uh, able to give us uh, one of the first prototypes, which was obviously somewhere tested already. It will go for another test, but it's here at LOPEC at the Innovation Showcase. So uh, if you are interested there, uh, what can be done with a smart she, uh, you can uh, take a look here. Further questions? Not yet. Maybe I'll start with one. Uh, you named sustainability, and uh, I think uh, you mentioned it starts from the use of substrates, and you're doing a lot of work of, uh, with different types of substrates, and probably not only plastic or different type of uh, that type is, is interested. I think one challenge, especially in printed electronics, is the combination of different type of substrate, different type of components. Uh, one of the key strengths of printed electronics, this hybrid, is maybe for sustainability a drawback. Do you see that same, or is there approaches uh, which uh, can be done in the future to even improve the situation of this combined materials? Do you mean the combination between the substrate and the active layer? It's, it's, com it's actually always a combination of different uh, substrates, the, the, the different active layers, so it's different materials. And the, you have a concept for one material, but the question is, if you have a combination of several, how do we deal with that? Uh, I understand. Yeah, of course, it's always about the interfaces. <laughs> In the end, it's always the interfaces that kill us. <laughs> yeah. 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 This is, this is true in a very broad sense. Uh, every, yeah, every emerging technology related to some sort of electronics suffers. I would say, I would lean myself out the window to say that they all suffer from interfacial phenomena. Or, or the lack of understanding, I'd say, of what's important for interfacial. I, I think that that is maybe what we have to learn, is learn more, more the interfaces and also having ways to, to yeah define also how to release these interfaces to have them uh, the separate components again at the end of life cycle. Yeah. I think it would be also interesting to develop or to spend more effort on developing in situ tools for interfacial analysis. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've seen one question here. Hello. Um, uh, thanks, thanks for the presentation. It was uh, very nice and it was like a cover in a wide range uh, point of the, uh, the flexible electronics. Um, the point that I was wondering about that uh, you already covered actually about the recyclable, um, sorry, the, the battery from the recycled materials um, in terms of sustainability. Um, so what kind of metals, I mean, is there any other more sustainable um, metals, that, sustainable study that you're working with, such as LCA studies or um, some, some like biodegradable um, technologies that we can maybe discuss later in your desk again. So that's one of my questions about that because um, so we can kind of build some, actually we can kind of build some um, batteries from recycled material but um, do we have any standardization of the recycling methods for the flexible electronics yet? That's the first question I have. The second one I have, um, how far this flexible electronics tag to replace our current traditional PCBs because when you go with a kind of a high level of the complexity such as uh, mobile phones or laptops, those kind of stuff, um, it looks like to me it's kind of really challenging at the moment to answer that demand. Um, so how far we are at the moment? So I have two questions. If I, if I understand the two questions, the first one is, is asking about protocols for recycling metals used in, in recyclable electronics. If we have standard protocols and if there are interesting metals to be used. So as far as I've seen at the moment so far in the exhibition as well, um, so most of the materials that is being used for these technologies like a polycarbonate, those kind of stuff, and some of them use some, um, some some copper or some of the other materials anyway, um, but it's not always decomposable. Um, so is there a specific method or any standardization um, in place at the moment for the recyclability? Uh, 
That's the first question. Okay, so, so maybe I, I answer it with two answers. I mean, the first is I would strongly encourage you to visit Christian May and Michael Hoffman's talks because they look exactly at these questions in more detail. So they look at different metals that are interesting to use in biodegradables and different substrates. More generally to the LCOA, I would say we need, we need to do more of that because sometimes, at least what I've seen in, in photovoltaics is in the lab you think, oh, I want to move away from lead or I want to move away from this heavy element. So I will, use, I will use tin or I will use this. But the problem is that if you move from heavy elements to lighter elements, these lighter elements sometimes get into the environment more easily. They may have more chemical um, reactivity. They may cause more problems than your heavy elements. And recycling is, of course, only interesting if it has an economic benefit. So who wants to recycle tin? goes into the environment, causes all sorts of problems, and you think, oh, hooray, I'm, I'm lead free. But actually, maybe using lead is, in a way, a better approach if the recycling is economically more attractive and you can really contain the lead and reuse it. I mean, cadmium telluride solar cells, for example, because they can be fully recycled, there's, you don't really have a lot of problem of cadmium telluride getting into the environment because it's so heavy, right? And then once it's cadmium telluride, it's not going anywhere. So I, I think it's a nice, it's of course a totally different technological area, but I think it's a nice example of how the, the, this answer is not that easy and that actually LCOAs should probably always accompany these sorts of research work so that we really know what are the elements that actually do pose a risk to the environment. Right? It may not be so obvious just based on being heavy or being this or being that. So, uh, so the first answer is please go to their talks because they're really looking at these questions. And the second is I don't think this is such an easy question and that I don't think that chemists and physicists, well, chemists maybe, but I don't think that physicists and engineers are the right ones to say, oh, this is environmentally friendly. I think this has to be done in a larger cooperation to really look at the full impact of, of the resources that we're using. You can also ask yourself where these metals are coming from. And this is also a question that we often ignore. So, very interesting question. I don't have the answer, but I, I do think it's something that needs more, more attention from the community. To the second question, now I can't remember it. I think it was... Uh... So, uh, to make it more detailed, actually, um, most of the flexible electronics, as far as I've seen, especially in here, uh. uh, their uh, working temperatures are around like 100 or 120 centigrade or something like that. And uh, most of the components is being replaced by some glue or those kind of stuff. Um, but in the traditional metals, we have already some uh, soldering and some soldering ovens which works with 230 centigrade. So, so it's not really matching with the current soldering traditional metals. Um, so this is just an example. But when you go with the high complexity of electronics, such as laptops on the mobile phones, um, so when you go in that level. Um, it doesn't, sometimes the cycle time is very behind for the flexible electronics. Sometimes that complexity is not really possible with the flexible electronics at the moment. So how far we are um, to get that level uh, for the flexible electronics? If, if I had the, the, the crystal ball, I would pull it out now. But uh, yeah, I think this is a question. But I, my personal opinion is we're not going to replace silicon. We don't, we don't have any need to replace silicon, um, there's no economic benefit from replacing silicon, and to build that pipeline again on a different material platform would require an investment that is incredible. So I think you can only integrate with silicon, that, that's the point. Uh, that, my personal opinion, who knows how the future will look, but um, I would think that it's not about replacing you know, the laptop with flexible electronics, it's about coming up with emerging applications like an augmented uh, reality over a sensor that can't be done from silicon because it's not flexible enough. So it will be the, the emerging applications, the niche applications where you can't use existing technologies. I think that's, that's what it will be. So sensors, optoelectronic sensors, things that are lightweight, low cost. Um, but the integration together with silicon is of course a very interesting direction. Right? So it doesn't have to be one or the other. I, I hope I answered your question. So, thank you. Um, I don't see any further questions right now. Probably Elizabeth is around, so you can uh, discuss with her further. Thank you again for this great talk.